so much, Elizabeth. Today we are celebrating probably my single favorite You You Sunday. Today is our flower ceremony and the flower ceremony is one of my favorite things that we do. I was so sad last year because I couldn't quickly find out a way to celebrate what is usually a really physically interactive service at a distance. The way we usually celebrate is we bring flowers to church and during the course of the service, the flowers that we have all brought, they represent our beautiful diversity and they become blessed in our presence. At the end of the service, it's traditional to take a flower that you did not bring, something that represents a piece of beauty found in the community that isn't what you yourself bring. It's hard to do at a distance. Can't share flowers with you very easily through the internet, but I figured something out for this year. First though, let's do a little history. <clears throat> if you've been around our community for a while, you might know that history is a little bit of a favorite subject for me, especially when that history is about the convergence of progressive radical religion, Unitarian Universalism, and Eastern Europe. As a person who grew up not particularly religious, but with a family with deep roots in Eastern Europe, uh, in what is now Czechoslovakia, it was such not Czechoslovakia anymore, the Czech Republic now. Goodness, I think it's the early 90s. Anyway, um, as someone with my own deep roots there, when I found Unitarian Universalism and I first experienced the Flower Communion, it was such a big deal to me that this piece of our tradition shares a origin place with my own family. So the flower ceremony, which we now celebrate, was created by Norbert Kopek, who was the founder of the Unitarian Church in Czechoslovakia. He was born in 1870 to a Catholic family in Southern Bohemia, which is also where my great grandparents were from. Kepek wanted to be a priest, but became really disillusioned with the Catholic Church and ultimately left when he was 18, becoming a Baptist minister and evangelist. He traveled all around Eastern Europe and was influenced by Moravian Free Christianity and the Moravian Brotherhood. The Moravian Brotherhood was uh, in a category of faiths called Hussites, and the Hussites were a pre-Protestant Christian movement, so not Catholics, but existing before the Reformation. And Hussites roughly means chalice people. A little bit like us, huh? So from these interactions, Robert Capic became more and more liberal and more and more anti-clerical. As he learned and grew and found more things, he wrote articles on everything from psychology to politics, and he attracted some really unfavorable attention from the German authorities. So in 1914, he, his wife, and their eight children fled to the United States where Norbert became editor of a Czech language newspaper and served as pastor of the First Slovak Baptist Church in Newark, New Jersey. His first wife passed shortly after they arrived in the United States. And in 1917, he met and married fellow Bohemian expatriate Maha Oktavec, who worked at the New York Public Library. He faced two heresy trials while in the United States at the accusation of Slovak Baptist ministers. And ultimately he resigned from Baptist ministry in 1919. 
if you've heard any of my other sermons on Unitarian and Unitarian Universalist history, uh, heresy trials are a big, big part of our history, being told that we are being too inclusive, too welcoming, too open to the other is a big part of our history. In 1921, Norbert and his wife discovered Unitarianism and began to attend the first Unitarian Church of Essex County, which is in Orange, New Jersey. Later that year, they decided to take Unitarianism home to their newly independent homeland. They founded a church to call, it was called the Liberal Religious Fellowship and it grew quickly. Their early worship services would have looked pretty familiar to modern Unitarian Universalists. They consisted of lectures. The minister didn't wear a lot of vestments. They didn't wear the robes or all the big fancy stuff that is common to Catholicism. And the congregation gave up a lot of their rituals. Some people wound up finding this a little lacking in a spiritual dimension. So responding to this and to the world around him, on June 4th, 1923, Norbert Capic introduced the flower ceremony. The format had to be one that wouldn't alienate anybody who had given up another religious tradition. The traditional Christian communion service was not going to work. The members of the congregation had such strong reactions to the Catholicism they had been raised and acculturated to that there was no going in the direction of bread and wine. So Norbert looked around to the beauty of their countryside and found elements for a communion, a bringing together that would be genuine to this community. Each member would bring a flower to the church where it was placed in a large central vase. At the end of the service, each member would take home a different flower. This symbolized the uniqueness of each individual and the coming together in communion to share this uniqueness. It was a success and it was held yearly just before the summer recess of the church. The flower communion was brought to the United States in 1940 and introduced to Unitarians around the country by Maha, who had herself been ordained in 1926 and who served as the minister of North Unitarian Church in New Bedford, Massachusetts from 1940 to 1943. Unfortunately, she was unable to return to Prague due to the outburst, outbreak of World War II. She had meant to come to the United States, introduce the flower ceremony, and then go home, but she didn't get to. Norbert had also been invited to the United States to stay during World War II, but he decided to stay in Europe. In 1941, Norbert and his daughter were arrested by the Gestapo who confiscated his books and sermons. He was charged with listening to foreign broadcasts and in 1942 was imprisoned alongside other religious opponents of Nazism in the Pristerblock at Dachau where he was killed later that year. When news of Norbert's death reached the United States, American Unitarian Association President Frederick May Elliott wrote, another name is added to the list of heroic Unitarian martyrs by whose death our freedom has been bought. Ours is now the responsibility to see to it that we stand fast in liberty. So, Today we celebrate the flower ceremony in the dual spirits of joy and remembrance. May we remember today 
Unitarian Universalist, Unitarian Universalist and other martyrs to free faith and liberty. Those who showed up and told the truth and accompanied people in pain. We remember Norbert Kopek who died in Dachau, Reverend James Reeb and Viola Lizu who died at the hands of virulent racists in Selma, Alabama. Greg McHendry and Linda Krager, who died in 2008, when a man motivated by hatred of, quote, Democrats, liberals, African Americans, and homosexuals, opened fire at the Tennessee Valley Unitarian Universalist Church, and they moved to protect the congregation. We remember also Dr. George Tiller, an abortion provider and leader in abortion rights who was assassinated as he served as an usher in his church on March 31st, 2009. And in this Pride Month, we remember countless gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender and queer people killed in acts of homophobic and transphobic violence here in the United States and around the world. As we remember, may we not be overcome by sorrow. May we remember in each of these martyrs the fight for a better future. May we take courage in their memories and strength from their resolve. In our sadness, may we find the joy and love which motivate such lives. Lives dedicated to freedom, to expression, to community, to liberation, and to helping. Let us here today take joy in the multiplicity of our experience, in that beauty and promise which is our diversity. Let us honor each person's unique path. Seek not a sameness which erases our difference, but a collaborative togetherness a oneness of spirit, which honors each path and sees strength in learning and growing from the margins. May this be a home where we can be loved into our best selves, where we, us chalice people, light in one another, fires which are both beacons and comforts on the hard, cold, dark nights of our souls. May we be friends and neighbors working together to a world transformed and transforming in a spirit of deep love. A love which expands beyond sameness and invites us into the divine collaborative dance of all creation. I want you to bring back into your minds those little seeds of your heart. I want you to think about what it might mean to plant that seed, to bring that seed into blossom in the world. Later today, I'll be taking these little paper hearts made of recycled paper and filled with wild, wildflower seeds up to the church. You will find them on the table by the art gallery. And if you are not able to get to the church for any reason, let me know and I'll put a couple in an envelope and mail them to you. These seeds, these little seeds of our hearts, these untamed wildflowers that do and grow as and where they please. That's how I think of us right now. We've been, was stuck as seeds for a while, right? In our homes, staying safe in our shells. 
surviving through a very cold winter, metaphorically, if not literally. It's time to become flowers again. It's time for us to make decisions about what and where we are going to plant ourselves, how we are going to bring beauty into this world, which so desperately needs all of us. Look inside your heart. Notice the seed that you need to plant. When you get your little heart, find somewhere to plant it. Maybe you are lucky and you have a yard that you can plant things in and you can plant your little seeds among other flowers in your garden. Maybe you need to get a little pot and you can put it out on your balcony. That's probably what I'll do. Maybe none of that is gonna work for you. And what you wanna do is take your little heart into the garden at the church and plant it there. You're the only one who can know where your seed needs to grow. You're the only one who can know what your particular gifts are, but they deserve to be planted. You deserve to live into something that might feel impossible, to have the opportunity to grow and bloom again and again and again, no matter what stage of life you're in. We are all filled with beautiful, beautiful possibility. And it is my daily prayer that we will live into it fully. Find your little heart at the church or let me know that you need it mailed to you. This goes for people watching on Facebook too. You can email me revkc at uuverdugo.org. I will send you, I have so many. I bought so many little hearts. So let's, let's do it friends. Let's make the world a little more beautiful. Let's grow where we can how we grow, being authentic and gentle with one another, but also audacious and dreaming big. Now is the time. Amen. I'm gonna turn us back to our wonderful pianist for our closing hymn. You, you, free bird, blue boat home. <laughs>